So our, our next speaker is a, a good friend and, and colleague, um, Conrad Ludgate. He's a senior engineer at TrueLayer. It's always uh, a great to learn stuff from Conrad because he's uh, always bringing like dark magic to, to work and sort of rust magic. Um, so please give a uh, warm hand for Conrad. Thank you. Uh, some of that dark mag magic even gets into production, so I'm very happy about that. Uh, so, had an info from Ethan, Ethan but I'll do it again. I'm Conrad, senior engineer at TrueLayer. Uh, there's a lot of us here, so if you're interested in what we do, you can find one of us. There's our logo. There's a few people here with logos. Uh, and I'm a bit of a nerd. Uh, I think these guys here would say probably a bit more than that. but. Um, and I am latest obsessed with Rust, specifically async, which is, I mean, quite applicable. And it's nice to see so many people here today, a packed room. Uh, I mean, async Rust is a super interesting area. Um, you're not going to learn a lot about using async here, but you're going to learn like <coughs> under the hood, like what's going on, uh, what is my program doing when I import Tokyo and such and such. Um, so uh, let's take ourselves back to 2016. Now, I wasn't in the Rust community in 2016, because this is the time when I created my first GitHub repository. I was just a little baby learning to code back here and then. But, uh, you know, um, so this is a history in retrospect. Uh, what if we were there today? What if we had to design these systems from scratch without any other external help? Um, so. Some of the, the, the historical things are going to be wrong, but it's going to get the idea of point across. Um, now, uh, I'm expecting this to be any experience uh, is OK for this talk. So even if you don't know any Rust, I hope you come away learning something new. Um, with that out of the way, uh, 2016 was before async await notation was even introduced to Rust. Uh, before coroutines were introduced to Rust, and the time when Tokyo got its first release. So uh, that was doing the math seven years ago now. Uh, what, a, what, a, what a time that's been. Um, so back in 2016, Rust has been released for just over a year uh, in stable. Yay! Um, and it's getting quite a lot of attention, uh, not just as a systems language, but as you've seen, it's grown more and more into other areas, so we could build like business web applications with Rust. Um, but uh, a lot of other languages. Well, okay, yeah. Why should we use? A why should we need async? We have threads. Like we we can do web applications with threads. Like that's what C plus plus has done for ages. Um, so you know that works. We can create a TCP listener, spawn a thread for each incoming request and handle the request on a thread. That will just work. We will handle as many requests as we needed for as many threads as we can spawn. And you know, using send and sync and Rust, uh, fearless concurrency, they say. Um, you know, uh, you don't have to worry about data races or anything. Um, and I mean, let's be real. We're going to run on like enterprise-grade software. We're going to have 22 core CPUs. We're going to dual socket them. We got threading horsepower to go around. Uh, so why do other languages decide to add their own async or multitasking or something? There must be something to it, right? Because uh, Go has Go routines, Elixir has green threads, Python has co uh, co -routine, async IO coroutines. Um, so there must be something I'm missing here, right? We, like, threads are fine. So well, one reason is context switching. Um, this may seem uh, quite abstract, but your this is a CPU. It's got a bunch of cores on it. We've got multi-core, multi-threads. Um, and let's say a thread is on one of those cores. All good. Uh, and then one of those thread cores gets overloaded with a bunch of threads. Your operating system is going to say, hey, that thread, you're going to need to move over here. Sorry, it's going to make it all fair and balanced. But uh, each core has a cache for the memory it's been using for the recent um, uh, 
logic that you've implemented. If you move your thread to a different core, all of that cache that you've built up, which can be up to um, 256 kilobytes in some cases, is all just going to be obliterated. It's not going to persist, and you're going to have to rebuild that cache from RAM. And if you're working on performant applications, uh, talking to RAM is not, your, is not what you want to do. You want to stay in cache as much as you can. So we might want to design a system where we can control the scheduling of, of tasks and only allocate as many threads as cores and pin those threads to the core. That's called a thread per core architecture. Um, so we might want to implement that in Rust for our own applications. Uh, another reason is control, control flow. So if you've worked with threads, Doing control flow between two threads is quite challenging. Um, so in this example, we want to read from a file, uh, but maybe we want to cancel it if it's taking too long. To do that with threads, we need to set, uh, insert this incantation of uh, libsequels, which uh, sets up a file descriptor set and does a select on the file descriptors for reads and then uh, sets a timeout for 150 milliseconds. I don't want to be doing that, uh, to be honest. I want a simple system that lets me do dot timeout 150 milliseconds. Um, so, you know, threads, you can't abstract this. You just, you have to put that um, down to the lowest level possible. So each I.O. call, you have to insert that timeout call, which is um, not very ergonomic. Another one is memory usage. Uh, th there are some myths around about thread memory usage. Some people say that you know each thread using two megabytes of stack means that spawning 100,000 threads will use 200 gigabytes of memory. But that's not true, because we live in a system with virtual memory pages. So you can have your two megabytes of stack, but only use a small chunk of it, and it will get allocated on demand. It's all very nice and all very uh, fancy. But threads are also still not free. So in my measurements on my MacBook, spawning as many threads as I could, 4,000, maybe there's a way to get more, uh, I reached 71 megabytes. Uh, and that's not a huge amount, but if you're dealing with hundreds of thousands of threads, that's going to build up pretty quickly. Um, and that's about 18 kilobytes of memory per thread. Uh, going back to what I said before, you know, 256 kilobytes of uh, cache per core, you're looking at maybe uh, 16 threads to fill out that cache. So if you have more than 16 threads per core, you're going to start hitting uh, cache bottlenecks. And uh, that's just not very good. Um, on the flip side, user space concurrency, so if we have our own task primitives, can be much, much smaller. So Go routines are reportedly about two kilobytes each, which is nine times more tasks you can fit on each core. Uh, lastly, Rust, as we've seen, is deployed to many, many devices and many, many applications. So it might be WebAssembly. We might want to integrate it with a game engine. Maybe we're talking about embedded systems. All of these things might be only single-threaded. So we want to, as Rust, support as many of these devices and capabilities as possible with our tasks. So it makes sense to have a task multitasking support without requiring threads. And lastly, I mean, we have all these examples to uh, look up to and be inspired by. All of these have tasks as a first-class citizen and sometimes even have threads as a second or third class citizen. So they've made the uh, opinionated decision that tasks in the user space are the way to go. So before we get into any Rust, we need to talk about scheduling. Uh, so we have a bunch of tasks, and we have a bunch of workers. How do we get those tasks to run? Uh, that's a good question. So we have our workers. Those are the lines down. We have some tasks. Um, 
And the scheduler's job is to decide which tasks run on which workers. Um, and a scheduler is concerned with a few metrics. So we have our waiting time, we have our ready time, and we have active time. So active means the CPU is running actual code, the, the, the task is running actual code on the CPU. Uh, the ready time is the task is ready to make progress, but is not yet making progress. And the waiting time means the task is waiting for something else to finish. So um, a scheduler's job is to minimize ready time, um, but also minimize the idle time for workers overall. Um, but as we discussed before, cache, it should not come at the compromise of moving something to another worker if unnecessary. Um, so the simplest way to design a scheduler is with cooperative scheduling. Um, and all of these languages you see uh, use that. And it's, it's a very sensible uh, system. So we have our tasks on our worker, and this big box on the side is our scheduler. Um, so we might tell, a uh, tell a, our worker to run a task. And when that task has decided it's done, it will uh, yield, and it will let the scheduler decide what on, what on next. Um, so, it's, so all the tasks have to cooperate. They have to decide that they, they should give up the access of the worker to another task. Uh, and this is very simple, and it models our control flow nicely because we can call in and then re return. Um, but there is downsides to cooperative scheduling. Uh, Windows and Mac, about 15 years ago, maybe longer, um, they used to use cooperative scheduling. Um, this was fine, but back in the days of, let's say, single or dual core CPUs, and you're running Photoshop, and you save a file, and Photoshop expectedly crashes, as it does, uh, that's just gonna, that's never gonna yield the control back to the CPU. So your, that thread is gonna stay running and never let any other work run. So it wasn't uncommon for those computers to just absolutely crash because one program decided to crash, and there's nothing you can do about that. So there is a solution, which is well, uh, crash, no longer yields, no tasks run. Preemptive scheduling. Preemptive scheduling is cool, but complicated. So it's the scheduler's decision that a task should stop. So the scheduler decides, no, that task is taking a little bit too long. I want to let some other task run because there's tasks building up in the queue. So it's going to interrupt the worker. It's going to say, worker, I know you're busy. Stop what you're doing. Let's run something else. Uh, and uh, OS threads do that now. As I mentioned, we don't want our application crashing to take down our whole computer. Uh, Golang does it, apparently, and so does Elixir. Um, now, this is good, but it's a quite aggressive action. So uh, the way Go does it is with this uh, wonderful assembly. Uh, I have removed quite a lot of the code to make it fit on screen. But essentially, because the CPU is doing work, there is going to be stuff in the registers. There's going to be stuff already in progress. The, uh, the instructions are already in, in, in the middle of being executed. So we need to save that state somewhere. So the first bits here are all just moving what's currently in the registers into the stack. Then it's going to call this async preempt function inside, uh, async preempt 2, very creatively named. Um, no judgments. Uh, and that's just going to check if there's another Go routine that can replace the current Go routine. And it's going to save the, the stack memory uh, to the Go routine's uh, memory, and it's going to run that instead. If there's no other Go routines, it returns, and it pops everything back off the stack and continues running. Um, but yeah, this, this is quite a complicated and convoluted setup. Uh, it requires all the threads to uh, set up signal handlers. Um, and it's sometimes not even actually memory safe. So Go does a lot of checks beforehand to make sure that a Go routine that's being preempted is OK to be preempted. This is not all easy. So sometimes it falls back to cooperative scheduling anyway. Um, so that being said, I think for now, let's go with cooperative scheduling for Rust. I think it's the simplest, it's the easiest to be memory safe, and it, it models the control flow quite nicely. Um, 
so we're going to go with the model of coroutines, uh, which model to the, um, the idea of the cooperative sketching quite nicely. So we might have a state for our coroutine that's completed or yielded. So if it's completed, our coroutine is done and it's got a value ready. If it's yielding, it's decided it's going to cooperate and give some time away to another task. And that can be modeled with our trait very easily. There's an output and there's a resume function. So resume is going to actually run the uh, active CPU time. And it's going to return either yield or complete. Uh, so let's finally touch on async. So we're actually getting some rust. Um, so back in 2016, they hadn't actually got a, sy a syntax yet. But let's re uh, you know, retroactively add the syntax. Um, so we have uh, three async functions. Uh, age and name, you can imagine them doing something a bit more complex. But for now, they just return directly. So they're not actually doing any async. But let's pretend they are for the case of response. So response is doing uh, two things. It's getting, well, three things. It's awaiting the name, it's awaiting the age, and then it's going to do some other processing afterwards with that data. So how that might look, um, we're going to make a state machine, basically. So our coroutine is going to be a state machine. Every step of the way, it's got to. So we're going to have an initialized state. We're going to have a name state. We're going to have an age state. We can be done, or we could have panicked halfway through. Uh, so we implement the boilerplate, we implement a coroutine response, it's going to return a string, and then we set our response function to return our coroutine and initialize. Very simple. So in that uh, resume function, we're going to have a loop and a match statement, and this is going to build our state machine. Um, if we call resume on done or panic, well, that doesn't make sense, so we're just going to panic anyway. Um, and we're going to do a mem replace here to set panic, so basically, we want the ownership of the data inside to use it temporarily. Uh, we're going to replace it with the panic state. So if we panic, we won't fill back the state, so it will be marked as panic. Uh, bit of boilerplate. But anyway, the, the core logic is actually going to be in this section here, the init, the name, and the age parts. So if we resume on init, we're just going to do the first thing that was in the function, which was uh, call the name function. And that's what we're doing here. And we set the state to name. Very simple. Uh, if we resume on name or age, actually, first of all, so there's no break at the end or return. So it's just going to go back in the loop and continue uh, doing this state machine logic until uh, something happens. So in the name logic, it's a bit more complicated. So name internally has another coroutine that's going to call. So it's going to resume that coroutine. And that coroutine might yield. So we're going to yield as well. But we're going to reset the state as we saw before. We set it to panic. So we're just going to reset the state. Um, but if it is complete, we can move on. We can now call the age coroutine. And we're going to set the state to age. And then a similar thing happens here. Um, you know, We can yield, and we set the state back to age. But it might complete. And that's the second and final thing we're waiting for. So now we can actually run our final logic, get our response, set the state to done, and return complete. Yay. Uh, if you like flow diagrams, kind of look something like this. I'm not going to dwell on it. <laughs> uh, so that's it. Thank you for coming to my talk. Um, clearly, we are done. So we've got a little scheduler here. Uh, it's just got a worker. And it's got a list of tasks that come in. So it's a first in, first out queue. Uh, we take the first uh, task. We resume it. If it yields, we're just going to put it back on the queue. No worries. Uh, if it completes, that's done. We're going to completely get rid of it. Uh, and then we're going to run that until it's empty. Great. Uh, what do you, what? OK, um, okay we're pinned at 100% CPU. Um, I'm sure that's fine. Uh, wait, you're saying our compl clients are complaining? OK, fine, whatever. Uh, let's find a better way. So we're going to need a way to say, well, as we saw before, if I go back ages, um, tasks can be waiting for something else. How do we model that? How do we model that a task is waiting? And how do we model that it needs to be ready and signal that it can be resumed? So. We're going to use parking to represent that. We can park a task 
much like we can park a thread. So if you don't know, in, o in the OS, you can say a thread is parked, and the OS will probably not run that thread until you unpark it. It can wake up randomly, but let's pretend like that doesn't happen. So let's, uh, let's take a look at this simple sleep example. It's going to uh, wait for a time and then wake up the task. So you've got a coroutine. We're now parking in this unpark uh, type into the coroutine. Uh, and that's going to give us a mechanism to unpark the coroutine, funnily enough. Um, so first of all, we check the time if it's uh, if the time current time is after the time we want to wake up, we will just wake up and say complete. But if it's not, then we want to register ourselves. So for now, we'll get onto it later. For now, we're just going to spawn a thread and have that sleep. And then when it oh, when it finishes sleeping, it's going to call unpark. So that's going to kind of do the uh, thing we want. So our task is going to pause. Is going to be set to waiting and uh, not ready, and then the, ta the, th the other thread is going to unpark us, and then our scheduler will hopefully run us. Um, and uh, So we can modify our worker a bit. I, I, I presume that it, this is kind of hard to read for you guys back. So um, here was the uh, worker from before, and uh, you notice we have only one list for tasks, and uh, now we have two, so we have ready and we have parked. Um, so for now, unpark is just going to be a number and it's going to be an ID of the task in question. Um, so we're going to run, we're going to get the first task, and we're going to get a new task ID. This could just be an increment. Um, we're going to mark that task as parked eagerly because um, we might want to wake up the task immediately. Uh, if you were at the async workshop yesterday, you'll you'll be familiar with that. Um, but uh, you know there there are reasons for that. So we 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 set it there just to say okay we're we're running it, but you can wake us up if you want to. We're gonna then resume our task. We're gonna pull the coroutine with our new unpark type, and if it yields, we will set it properly as parked. We will. Uh, yeah, we will insert it and replace that none from before, and it will become the task. Um, so if the entry has actually been removed, then we've been woken up between our poll, as I mentioned before. You might want to do that. So we've already been woken up. We're ready. We're just going to push us back to the ready queue, and that's going to busy loop. There are reasons to do that. Uh, I won't discuss further later for now. Uh, but if we're done, we're just going to completely remove ourselves. We are done. We're not going to ever wake up again, so that's fine. And then some extra stuff here. Um, if the parked is empty and we have exited this loop, that means our tasks are empty, then we have nothing left to do, we can exit. But if we have stuff in the parked queue but nothing in the ready queue, we're going to pause the thread. Um, and we could say that unpark the type has a way to wake up the thread later. Uh, so with that mechanism, how do we actually use it? So a common thing we might want to do is I.O. Uh, of course, we were discussing in the context of web processing anyway, so I.O. is very important. Um, on Linux, there's a mechanism called ePoll, and on uh, uh, BSD and uh, Mac OS, there's a mechanism called KQ. They're kind of similar, but the idea is that we can create a ePoll instance that will be an event poll object. And then we'll create our TCP stream. And then we will uh, register that TCP stream onto our ePoll event object instance. We will tell it, hey, I'm interested in when this file, which is a TCP stream, everything's a file, uh, will say, when this file has something coming in, so that's the event poll in, I want you to send us some data. And for now, we're just going to use the unpark uh, ID as that data. Uh, and in a separate thread, we can then have something busy looping on this event poll. Once it gets an event, it will then unpack the task. And that way, we can have something a bit like this. Um, so we have three concepts. We have our scheduler. 
which manages which tasks are ready and which tasks are pending. We have our worker, which is actually running the tasks. And we have our IO worker, which is doing our EPOL stuff. So um, this isn't doing anything fancy just now, but we have our worker running this red task. And then it's doing some IO, and it's going to block. So it yields. But before it yields, it's going to tell the, uh, the IO thread, hey, I've got this file. Uh, please, please look after it for me. Um, and that's going to go back to pending, uh, and our work is going to go park. So nothing's going to happen uh, until the IO is done. So that epoll wait call will finish. And then it will see the event, and it will tell that task to unpark. So that goes back to the scheduler. That task is put to the ready queue. And that worker is then going to pick that task up and proceed. Now, that's nothing major. We could have just put that on the worker. So why bother with the separate IO worker queue? Well, it's because we can have multiple tasks using the same IO worker queue. And that's really the key thing. We can have multiple tasks running on one thread, and then multiple IO events running on another thread. Uh, and they can all be interleaved very nicely. Um, we can do the same with timers. So epoll has a timeout, fun uh, timeout uh, parameter. So if we want to sleep for a period of time, instead of uh, waiting for an event, we can wait for a timeout. And we can use that, again, to unpark just as normal. Um, finally, uh, channels are a very common feature. So we might want to send data from one task to another. Um, and that can be very easy with this unpark mechanism. So we have our channel structure. It's very simple. It only has one slot, just an option. Uh, and then it also stores an unpark uh, behind an option. Uh, we create our channel. We create the inner uh, object, and it's going to be ArcMutext. So we can share it, and we can modify it uh, independently. And we're going to spit that out as our sender and receiver pair. Um, and our sender and receiver are going to do uh, fairly basic things for now. They're just going to call a send for a coroutine and a receive coroutine and await those. Uh, so what does send look like? Uh, it just stores the uh, reference to the mutex of the inside and uh, a value to be sent. On first resume, we, we lock the inner to see, yeah, is there a slot available? Um, if the slot is full, we are going to yield. There's nothing we can do now. We can't push into a full channel. But we can set our unpark on that channel. So the idea is, when something takes from the channel, our task will be woken up to put something back into the channel. Um, if it's not full, we can uh, put the value in, um, and then unpark if there's a receiver. So this goes both ways. If there's something waiting for a value, the unpark will be set there. And we can then wake up them so they can progress with the value. Uh, and you see receive a very similar idea, but uh, you know it tries to take the value. If there's nothing, it yields. If there is something, it will take it and then try to wake up who was trying to send. So that's very cool. We, we modeled quite a large set of useful um, uh, capabilities with this uh, coroutine structure so far. Um, so some of you may already be familiar with this concept. So I'm going to take away the coat of paint. Um, so this coroutine is obviously our future type, future trait, that you may have seen in Rust. And our state is actually called pol. Uh, we called them future because there's a value uh, available in the future. Very creative. Uh, and we're just calling it pol because we're going to pol it. Very creative. Um, so that's the future we have today. So we've just gone through the last seven years in about 30 minutes. That was uh, great. But there's some safety problems, memory safety. Now, if you don't understand like the deepness of like pointers and memory safety, that's OK. I'm going to go through it, uh, baby steps. So we have a fairly simple uh, concept that we might want to read some data asynchronously. I mean, we've already talked about I.O. We know how that works with the EPOL. That's fine. But how do we represent that in our type system? So we might have a, we already have our read trait. 
That's a very simple, we, we know how that works. We give it a buffer, and then it will fill that buffer and tell much how much was full. Uh, with async read, same idea. We're going to give it a buffer, and it's going to return a read future. That future is then going to eventually complete and give us our how much was full. Uh, and to do that, obviously, it's going to need a reference to the buffer and a reference to the uh, type being read. All very simple stuff. Um, so let's put this into practice. We're going to have an async function that abstracts this away rather unuse uh, uselessly because it doesn't even return anything useful. But it's going to create a TCP stream. It's going to connect it. It's going to create a buffer. It's going to pass that buffer into read. And we're going to build our read state machine. Great. Uh, so we've got our init state. We've got our done state. We've got our panic state. We have our TCP, TCP stream connect state. That's all fine. We're used to that. And then we go to our read state. So when we're waiting for the data to be read, we're going to hold on to a few things. We're going to hold on to our buffer. We're going to hold on to our TCP stream. And we're going to hold on to the read future. You may see the comment down here. If we looked before, we have some lifetimes here. But we have no lifetimes in our state machine. This is because these lifetimes point to these objects here. And if you know anything about Rust and memory safety, you'll know that self-referential structs are just not safe. Uh, and why? Why are they not safe? So let's say this is our memory. So we have our red object here. This could be our buffer. And we have our blue object over on the right. And that's our read future. And that's pointing to our buffer. Let's say for some reason the compiler or something decided to move our memory from one spot to another. Well, now that pointer isn't going to be told to update. That pointer is pointing to uninitialized memory, and that's just going to go bang. So we need a mechanism to say this memory will not move. Um, we could go the C++ approach and have move constructors. Um, but if you've ever used those, no thank you. Um, yes. <laughs> so we could just um, make an abstraction. As we're referring, we're going to make an abstraction. Uh, let's call it pin, because we're going to pin our future in place. Um, and the mechanism we're going to do for that is very simple. So that is already true for references. If we have a reference, we know the data it's referencing is not going to move. That compiler is going to enforce us that for us, and that's very nice. So the problem is we can get rid of that reference, move the value, get a new reference. And that's all well and good, but our value is the self-referential reference. So that's what we're trying to avoid. We're trying to avoid creating the reference, destroying it, moving, creating a new reference. So we can use this type pin and make it unsafe to use. So constructing a pin is unsafe. So you can't construct it twice, is the concept. You can construct it once. That's OK. And once it's pinned, it must remain pinned. Uh, you're not allowed to move it and then construct a new pin. So we ensure there's only one constructed reference to that memory location. And it's not going to be constructed after it's moved. Um, but we don't want to use unsafe all the time. So we can add a safe abstraction on top. So we know that if we box a type, it's going to be allocated on the heap. And we know that heap is not going to move. Nothing's ever going to move that. Um, to do this, we need to change pin a little bit. So before, I just hard-coded it as a mutable reference. But we can be a bit fancy with our traits and use our deref mute trait. So if our p is a pointer and it implements deref mute, we can stuff that into our pin. And that way, we can do stuff like pin box, which you may have seen. So this makes it safe to do, because we know that the box will never move beneath us. Uh, so let's recap. Um, we want to control schedule tasks ourselves. So we get better efficiency and allows us to cancel tasks much easier. We model the tasks as coroutines which we call futures. And we pull those coroutines to make progress. By interleaving polling of coroutines, we can simulate concurrency. 
Now, we learned before, we don't poll repeatedly. Instead, we, let a, uh, we implement a mechanism for the task to wake themselves up, and then we poll them. And for the async to be safe, we need to allow self-referential data structures. And to do that, we provide a set mechanism called pin. And now you know everything about async Rust. What's next for async Rust? There's a lot of stuff in the works. Um, so if you're interested in any of this, um, join Zulip, uh, the Rustlang Zulip. There's a stream called WG for working group, WG-async. And there's a really a lot of interesting stuff going on there. If, you, if any of the stuff I talked about here seemed intriguing to you and you want to learn, learn even more, um, go there, read, this, read the topics. Uh, there's some really st interesting stuff coming in the future. So for instance, I haven't touched anything about async traits. Async traits are just not a thing we have yet. There's some nightly um, unstable features for async functions and traits but there's still a lot of open questions there. So you can actually take part in this. We couldn't take part seven years ago, but you can take part now. Um, async iterator is a trait we want. So some, some people might know that as stream, but it seems it's gonna be called async iterator. So we might want to have some continuous data coming, but have it in an async way. Async read and write we saw before, but what's that gonna look like when it gets into the standard, standard library? async functions and async closures. Not even gonna talk about that now because that's just a whole can of worms if you've dealt with anything like that. Um, so there's concepts called structured concurrency. Um, Rust can use structured concurrency, but it's currently not uh, exactly a first class citizen. If you use uh, runtimes like Tokyo, they're all unstructured concurrency because it's just Tokyo spawn. But should we, you know, should we adopt to, uh, structured concurrency more? Can we make it more ergonomic? Can we encourage people to use it more? Um, async drop. So, you know, the drop functions, they're all synchronous, but we might want to do some cleanup uh, that is asynchronous. How do we do that? We currently can't. Uh, that's a lot of questions right there. So, and then uh, send and sync, we talked about, you know, Thread safety, so, but what about task safety? Is there a concept of task safety that we can do? Uh, not currently yet, but if you've ever used uh, a mutex, held it across an await boundary, and you've got a deadlock, you know what I'm talking about. Um, now, I went through very quickly, but we're almost at 40 minutes, so uh, thank you all for listening. Now, I just want to mention, um, uh, I knew nothing about any of this a year ago. So uh, when, I, when I started working with Rust full-time, I, I, you know, I realized I was using async all the time. Um, and I would always go into the standard library and look up stuff. But async was this kind of black box. I couldn't control click through to the async function. It just doesn't make sense. So. Um, you know, uh, I had to look through a lot of uh, a lot of blog posts. Uh, I read through pretty much all of the Tokyo source code, which is a nightmare. Uh, I recommend it to everyone if you have the patience. Um, but what I'm trying to say is that I think anyone can learn this stuff if you're dedicated enough. So if you're if you're really curious and you want to find something to contribute to, I think anyone can pick this up and you can make a real difference to the language moving forward. So please check out Working Group Async. Please uh, just you know, file issues if you have any async troubles because we want to make the language better. We want to make async better experience for everyone. <laughs> and now I think we can have some questions. Hello, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, you said that some of the magic you showed us, uh, you're using in production. And I wonder, basically, if you can uh, tell more a little bit of your production experience and basically do you use Tokyo uh, or something else? And uh, what's uh, beyond Tokyo that you may need to do by hand uh, 
and uh, and therefore improve like the quality of life of uh, fellow developers. Uh. Yeah, sure. So we use Tokyo uh, a true layer, um, pretty extensively. Uh, we have I don't think we've even considered using anything else. Um, Tokyo is just the 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 oldest and most mature of them, um, and it, it does just work. Um, but it is. Uh, it only provides very primitive concepts. So you just have your Tokyo spawn and you have some basic TCP operations. So obviously you need to have abstractions on top of that. And you've got libraries like Actix Web, Axum to do HTTP. We've got uh, Tonic to do gRPC. Those are all you know, fairly integrated to do with the Tokyo system as well. Um, so uh, on top of that, so you've got to provide the libraries for uh, what you know, requests you're going to handle in your web applications. Um, so we've had to write a few of those in TrueLayer for stuff like um, AMQP for RabbitMQ. Uh, so we have a whole um, currently proprietary stack. Um, I'm getting nagged by a few people to try and make that open source. This is news to you guys at the front. But uh <laughs> uh, so that might be open source in the future. I'm not making any promises for now. Um, but yeah, so you, you have to build on top of the primitives. There's no, uh, there are a lot of um, uh, fully fledged frameworks for you but um, you do have to pick and choose. Uh, the problem currently with the ecosystem is very split. So if you want to use, let's say, async standard runtime, it's quite difficult, because if you want to use the request library to make requests, that's Tokyo. If you don't have Tokyo compatibility, you cannot use async standard. And then you have to spawn an IO worker thread in the background, it's all very complicated. So uh, that's currently a big problem. Um, did that answer your question? Great. So, so you looked into a bit of how this like the kernel threads are done. What if you go in the opposite direction, like something like Dragonfly BSD, and make your kernel threads very lightweight, so you can spawn a lot of them cheaply? How how do you think that will compare to going the async way that Rust have done? So you're saying uh, should should like uh, kernels try and make threads extremely lightweight? So that we don't have to do this, and that the yeah, that's a great idea. And I think like there is desire to do that, but you know, as we mentioned, threads on uh, the OS will probably be always be preemptive. There will always be complications there. We're not just going to go to cr uh, cooperative concurrency there, but our application can very well know that it's going to be cooperative. Um, another thing is, yeah, like the OS is just going to do a lot of bookkeeping regardless. Uh, I don't think there's any way of avoiding that. Um, it'd be really nice if we could have like a really slim Linux kernel that we could run on our Docker images that can do that. But with the thing of Docker is that you you share the kernel underneath, so you're still going to have a very complex kernel running in your Kubernetes cluster. Um, yeah, I mean it's it's a nice idea, but I think in practice it's quite um, uh, troublesome. Uh, yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, yeah, you focus a lot on the kind of futures themselves, but yeah. less on the scheduling, perhaps. And so I'm, I'm deeply locked into Tokyo in a project yeah. at the moment. And I'm finding that I need, I would like to be able to kind of schedule tasks on different workers according to priority queues, stuff yeah, like yeah. that, or deadlines made and moved yeah. to another worker. Um, have you had much experience with customizing the Tokyo scheduler, and do you have any tips for? Uh, yeah, that? sure. Um, so Tokyo has a nice capability called um, local set which is basically you take the work stealing scheduler runtime that Tokyo does, and it put, turns it into a single threaded runtime. Um, so you can spawn your own thread manually, set up a local set for that runtime, and then you can spawn tasks on that local set specifically. So on top of that, you can have your own distributor of tasks, and you can manually move tasks from one to the other. This is what Actix Web does. So Actix Web is a uh, notoriously thread per core, not properly because it doesn't. I, d I don't think it does the, the the thread pinning, but it's the kind of idea, um, and that way you don't have to worry about sync and send as much. But um, you you can use yeah local set to uh, more control your workers. Hi. Uh, first of all, thanks for the talk. Really informative. I was wondering, you were talking about the future of async and Rust. Are there any plans to handle, um, you know, kind of the async pollution that happens if you introduce 
uh, like an async dependency, for example, to an otherwise non-async project. I have a big problem where if I ever use like a library that's based around futures or async, uh, you know, because there's no uh, like good way to basically block off the async part of the code, it basically turns my entire project into an async project and I have to uh, use Tokyo for it and I run into all the other limitations about not being able to drop stuff that requires async calls like to close connections, for example, uh, and it you know, messes with my ability to like use traits and callbacks and all those other things. So it would be easier if I could just you know, seal off the async part of the application altogether. Yeah, uh, the, you can actually do that. Um, it takes a little bit of effort, but um, so Tokyo, um, you can create runtimes fairly cheaply. You can create a single threaded runtime just for free. Um, and then you can call block on, and then you can do that as low as you want. So uh, as soon as you get to an async layer, you can just block on that async function. Uh, and that lets you sort of turn an async into a sync function. Um, it does all the parking underneath, and it does the scheduling, and it, it, it just works. Um, you might want to make the runtime more long-lived, so yes, it will be a bit intrusive. And the uh, if you know the request library, you'll know that it has the spawn, it has the blocking module. So internally, that does all this underneath. It will create a Tokyo runtime, and it will just spawn things on that runtime and block on them. Um, it is a bit annoying. I agree with you. the the the, the function coloring problem is is real. Um, if you're if you're really into async and you're async all the way, it it, it works really nicely. But yeah, if you're working in sync applications, it can be a pain. I have a few of them myself, um, which have to call out the async functions, and um, I, I, I want to move the, the async lower and lower and try and get rid of it as much as possible. So uh, I don't know any solutions other than just using um, block on there, unfortunately. There's a few questions over here. A lot of questions today. It's really nice to see lots of um, interest in async. It is a really interesting uh, area. Uh, so Tokyo interacts with the kernel for OS level threads. Uh, can you speak on how async works in embedded environments in libraries such as Embassy? Uh, how similar is the implementation? Sure. Um, I'm, I'm not an expert in embedded applications, but I would expect uh, for an embedded system, either you have some external device that will uh, perform uh, signal interrupts to your microprocessor. You can use those to trigger uh, these uh, thread wake-ups. Uh, alternatively, you might just busy loop. Uh, you know, There's nothing else going to run in your microprocessor. It's not going to be a problem. Maybe your battery life might suffer, but maybe you can go into low power mode. Uh, I can't speak much more about that. Um, you mentioned earlier uh, the performance issues with multiple threads yep. on a single core. Uh, is there a way to get around pin boxes and for more advanced, uh, more performant code requirements for async? Uh, good question. Uh, not sure I have an answer for that directly. Um, yeah, I mean, tuning async and tuning threads is like, I think, probably PhD worthy research. Um, I don't think I'm qualified to answer. So you mentioned that um, futures are basically wrapped into a pin, a uh, box, and then pins. I assume this is a simplification. Not all the futures are boxed. Can't they just live on the stack? Yeah. So uh, they definitely can. Uh, so not 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 all things need to be boxed to be pinned. Uh, box is just the easiest abstraction and the safest abstraction to pinning stuff. Um, recently, in the uh, standard library. Um, we have a um, uh, docs.rustlang. I can't type. Go to docs. Oh, come on. I never remember what the docs are. Uh. Okay, pin. Um, we will find a macro called pin. Um, if you've used uh, Tokyo or Futures, 
there will be a similar macro. It works a little bit differently. Uh, this is a bit more ergonomic. But yes, you can pin stuff on the stack. There are limitations, however, because, for instance, your future cannot outlive the function that is being called in. So that works great for structured concurrency, um, but it doesn't work for any unstructured concurrency. Um, but yes, you can just call this pin, and it will pin it for you. It will underlying do the pin new and checked, but it makes it in such a way that you cannot move the original, um, so it's all still safe. So yes, uh, box is just an oversimplification, uh, and you don't need to use it. Uh, great talk. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, so you mentioned that different libraries may depend on different async runtimes. Yeah. Do you think there's value in uh, Rust having its own async runtime in the standard library? <sighs> <laughs> yes and no. So I think it's important for the Rust standard library to have the primitives required. So it could be the async read um, or the, the networking stuff. I think those are quite important, so that the other runtimes can share them. I don't think there's a lot of value in the Rust itself having the runtime to do that, um, because it's 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 uh, you know there are so many choices and so many reasons why you might want to choose one or the other, and um, there are even simpler packages that aren't in the language, which probably might make sense. Like people complain about not having a regex in the language. Uh, we've uh, shoved off into a crate. It's still maintained by the Rustlang team. It's just it evolves so much faster than Rust can evolve, so that it just needs to be put into a separate place. Um, so I think it's a really nice idea to have something like that in the language. But uh, with with everything with like web programming and async programming, that is just going to move at a different velocity to Rust itself. So it makes sense to keep it outside. Any more questions? What is the main use case when you would like to write implement future for, for a struct instead of just calling like I think await it kind of generates it for you? Sure. Uh, I mean, yeah, good question. Um, it's usually when you want to to get more performance and like you know exactly. Uh, what data is going to be used when and where. Um, also, there are. Uh, so I mentioned that we don't have any async read and write, and I and I brought up the self-referential problem from before for like uh, the async read, but um, there is a mechanism that they used before we had pin. So when Tokyo first released uh, in 2016, pin was not a concept we had yet. Um, so they needed a mechanism to do this. So back then, they all implemented manual futures. And if we take a look at the Tokyo docs, uh, and we find their async read, we notice that it does, um, it's implemented as um, a polling abstraction on top of it. So um, maybe you want to use this directly to avoid using pin. So you will manage the buffers yourself. You will pass in the buffer on every read call rather than on the overall read call. So uh, maybe you want just more control over the buffers and stuff like that. Um, yeah, that's it for now. Uh, and another reason is, well, uh, as I mentioned, structured concurrency. Uh, I haven't gone into too much detail about that. The general idea is you have, let's say, two features, and you want to pull one off the other. Um, you will need to implement a manual future to be able to interact with the underlying features. Um, but in in your application code, probably never. You just want to uh, use async await. Thank you very much, Conrad. Please give him a massive hand. <laughs> so you you shared your you shared your socials. You shared where people can find you and yep. interact with you. Well, and everything uh, else. Yeah, you can find me, uh, Conrad Ludgate, on Twitter. Um, 
and you'll also find me on the Rust community Discord. I'm there a lot. Uh, I've had a few people come up to me, and that's very nice. Thank you. Great. Uh, just two points. We're going to break for lunch in like five minutes, and there's going to be a massive social after the conference day. So when all the talks are done after the last keynote, we're going to get really drunk. Uh, <laughs> it's going gonna, it's gonna to be uh, DJs, there's going to be uh, lots of drinks and food and everything else. And the second thing is, please, please, please check out the game jam that's happening downstairs to the left hand uh, corner. If you are interested in game development in Rust, if you're curious about it, uh, you can find the room that's dedicated for game dev. It's not a thing that you've got to stay in there for the whole day. You can come in, come out really casual, and there's going to be prizes for people who actually stick around and give it a go. So you can get yourself introduced to Bevy, get yourself introduced to the Valoran en engine as well, and it's a lot of fun. So downstairs, um, to your left, and then left again, and you'll see a room on the side. Go in there, say hello to Forrest, ask questions about game dev in Rust, and yeah, give it a go. Another hand for Conrad, please.